thanks very much, uh, Kelly uh, and Georgia Public Policy Foundation for having us here today on this important day uh, and this important week. I would be remiss uh, before starting remarks about uh, our Ben and my uh, presentation if we did not acknowledge some of the pioneers of the school choice movement in Georgia that uh, while we may be the experts, they were, I think, the leaders early on. And I just would like to take executive privilege to acknowledge just a few of the folks here, in particular Glenn Delk and Hunter Tyson, who for years, uh, perhaps 20 or more, I know 20 or more, have been leading the fight for school choice in Georgia. Uh, both uh, very publicly at times and also uh, privately at times, and we thank you for that. Alan Hughes is here. Uh, Alan Hughes uh, started, uh, uh, along with Hank McCamish, a privately funded uh, school choice scholarship organization uh, for children uh, in Atlanta and Georgia. Uh, and uh, I'll get into uh, uh, our tuition tax credit program that we have here in Georgia, but Allen's scholarship organization was really the predecessor to that, uh, and we thank him for his leadership. Uh, Susan Myers has been a longtime chronicler of the school choice movement in Georgia and also uh, behind the scenes uh, and sometimes pub very publicly uh, advocating for school choice. Uh, and then the Georgia Catholic Conference, Pat Shivers and their Gray Scholars program has uh, also taken advantage of this wonderful tuition tax credit law. I know that there are others, including those who serve our, our public school communities, the state and local school board members that are here today, and we really appreciate what all of us are doing in, in the area of education to uh, improve opportunities for children. I am uh, going to be talking today a little bit about the Georgia Education Expense Tax Credit Program. Uh, known as HB 1133 in some circles. We're going to talk about a, the survey results from a very interesting survey that Ben Scafferty uh, and I conducted uh, of Georgia Gold Scholarship Programs uh, uh, back last year. Uh, we're going to uh, look at those results and ask the question whether education policymakers are respecting the reasons why parents choose a particular school for their children. And then finally, uh, we're going to look briefly at whether we are moving toward an educational opportunity society or are we uh, moving toward an educational operating system. So how does the Georgia expense um, tax credit program work? Taxpayers in Georgia receive a Georgia income tax credit for contributions to qualified student scholarship organizations that provide scholarships to qualified students to attend accredited private schools. Individuals are limited to $1,000 if you're a single individual taxpayer, $1,250 if you're married filing separately, and $2,500 if you're married filing jointly. Owners of pass-through entities, such as interest in S corporations, LLCs, and limited liability partnerships and partnerships are able to contribute up to $10,000 of their Georgia income tax liability. This is a new provision in the law that uh, a lot of advocates worked hard for uh, last session and it has really uh, proven to be quite a boon to the uh, use of the education expense credits for scholarships uh, and we're excited that so many uh, pass-through entity taxpayers have taken advantage of this. Finally, uh, C, regular C corporations can take a tax credit for up to 75 percent of their Georgia income tax liability. So how popular has this great uh, educational expense uh, tax credit program been? Uh, well, uh, you know, millions of dollars have been contributed by taxpayers and Thousands of children are now receiving scholarships as a result. Early on in 2008, unfortunately, uh, you know the law came into effect mid-year, and uh, it was very difficult to use all of the 50 million dollar cap. Uh, so a lot of it went to waste. It does not roll over each year. A, a change in the law, we have not been able to secure what doesn't go, uh, what isn't used, doesn't go forward to the next year. So we left a lot on the table in 2008, 2009. We got up to uh, 25.4 million of, of the credits being used. Uh, then uh, the next year, uh, 41 million, and then finally uh, in uh, 2011, all of the uh, tax credits were uh, used by taxpayers. So what has happened in 2012, 2013, and then 2014 is quite a story. Uh, so taxpayers in 2012 actually sought pre-approval for and received uh, uh, approval from the Department of Revenue for their tax credits by August 13, 2012. The, the cap uh, lasted only 8.5 months. Then in 2013, the, actually we've had an increase in the cap to 58 million, and the cap lasted four and a half months. And then in 2014, 
Uh, all of the people who had contributed in the past were so excited about, about the possibility and be able to do so again. We had a lot of pastor owners express interest. And I know uh, uh, I serve as volunteer general counsel of the Georgia Gold Scholarship Program. Uh, and we had taxpayers filing in line before the end of the year to claim their credit for this coming year, which means they'll be contributing uh, in the first two months of 2014 for a tax credit they won't be able to take advantage of uh, until they file their re return for 2014 and 2015. And the cap was met on January 22nd, uh, 2014 quite a story, and, and uh, I was asked to start the Georgia Gold Scholarship Program, like I mentioned, was uh, uh, preceded by Allen's uh, Scholarship Program. I work for Federal Society, I don't get paid by Georgia Gold. They wanted a competent person running it uh, after I started it, and uh, my wife, Lisa Kelly, is the CEO of Gold, which just increased uh, their uh, you know tax credit usage uh, up to about 34% of the tax credit uh, available in Georgia, so it's quite a story, uh, and uh, I commend you for that, Lisa. So now uh, I'll turn it over to Ben Scaffold, who's going to tell you a little bit about our scholarship survey uh, and its results. It's always an honor uh, to speak to the oldest and most venerable think tank in Georgia, the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. So, Kelly, thanks for this honor for letting me speak today. Um, it's not so great being Ben Scaffold. Um, I have a flip phone. Um, and, and, and when I talk, you know, David Martin's probably pulling out his flip phone because he's with the Georgia Council for Economic Education. A lot of economists have flip phones, but mine is duct taped. Um, so it's, it's not all, not all great, Jim. Um, today I want to talk to you about the uh, 2013 Goal Parent Survey. We surveyed parents and caregivers of Goal Scholarship recipients to ask them why they chose private schools and how they did it. Um, these low and middle income parents were asked a variety of questions about themselves, why they chose a private school, what information did they deem important when choosing a private school, and how did they obtain this information. A little bit about goals so you know about who these people we surveyed are. Um, they're low and middle income. Uh, about uh, the average uh, adjusted gross income is about 25,000 adjusted for family size of gold scholarship recipients. About 50% of the recipients have an adjusted family income of 24,000 or less, and about 90% have an adjusted gross income of 48,000 or less. About 36% of the scholarship recipients are, are minorities, and it's a statewide program. Uh, about 6,000 scholarships in North Georgia, about 6,000 scholarships in South Georgia. So it truly is a statewide program. And now to the survey results. We asked parents that these were parents who were in a public school and then received a gold scholarship or were able to choose a private school. We asked them, how satisfied are you with your decision to send your child to a private school as opposed to a public school? 98.6% of gold scholarship recipients said they were either very satisfied or satisfied with their decision to move their child from a public school to a private school. Um, then we asked them, we gave them a list of 21 specific reasons why you chose to move your child to a private school, and they could fill in other reasons as well. And we asked them, what's your most important reason for choosing a private school, second most important, etc. And these were the reasons that were in their top five, top five reasons for choosing a private school. And you can see about 51% said better student discipline, and another 51% had better learning environment in their top five. 49% smaller class sizes, 47% improved student safety, 39% more individual attention for my child. And I'd like you, if you can see it, to go to the very bottom number. Higher standardized test scores was way down the list, and only 10% of Gold Scholarship parents said that was in their top five reasons for choosing a private school. No parents, not one, not one, had higher standardized test scores as their top reason for choosing a private school. Then we, um, so here's the most important reason. 28% said better education. 28% uh, said a religious education. 11% said better learning environment. I think there's two takeaways from these last two charts. One is parents have a very wide diversity of reasons why they chose a private school. And standardized test scores is not something they value highly. 
What information do parents want when they're choosing a private school? Again, we gave them a list of 21 different items and they could add to that list if they liked. Um, parents want a ton of information. They could have checked all 21 if they liked and you can see that 84% want to know about class sizes. Uh, another 70% wanted evidence that the school was accredited. Um, 77%, I'm sorry, 70% said they want to know about curriculum and content of, of classes. 61% uh, wanted the percent of students who attend college. And 56% uh, wanted to know about the religious affiliation of the school. And 53% uh, wanted to know average test scores on standardized tests. How would parents get this information? We gave them a list of eight items and they could add to the list as well. Um, parents, on average, would take over five affirmative steps, five time-consuming steps to get information about private schools before they chose. 93% um, wanted to ask to tour the school. 78% would ask parents, friends, or relatives. 76% would attend an informational meeting at the school. 73% would view the school website and so on. What if schools declined to provide parents with the information they desired? We asked them, would that affect their decision of where to send their child to school? 79% of these low and middle income parents receiving gold scholarships said if a school declined to provide them with any of the information that they wanted, it would impact their decision on where to send their child to school. Another 20% said it might, and less than 1% said it would not. Now for another view, and, and I put this slide up there because, it, well, you can see the video on the internet, just, you know, it's, it's very sh uh, shocking, but you hear comments not as stark as this, but you hear comments like this in state capitals all across the country, including ours. This is from a public school superintendent in Wisconsin, and she said, African American families are the ones who are most prone to enroll their kids in the fly-by-night schools that cropped up after vouchers existed. African American families don't know how to make good choices for their children, they really don't. They didn't have parents who made good choices for them or helped them learn how to make good choices. So they don't know how to do that. Our results paint a different picture. It seems like low and middle income parents are quite good at choosing schools for their children. Parents choose private schools for a wide variety of reasons and standardized test scores are not among the most important reasons. Instead of trying to turn private schools into public schools, states should promote an educational opportunity society, and Jim's gonna talk about that in a minute. But that society should facilitate, barring from the economist Friedrich Hayek, a spontaneous education order. And Hayek separates it into two things. There's minimum rules of just conduct and minimum rules of organization. Rules of organization tell private schools how to do their business. But we do that to public schools and those are the schools parents are leaving. We shouldn't do that. What we should do is have rules of just conduct that support and help parents make better decisions and get more of the information they want. How many of you have used Yelp when you're looking for a restaurant? Right? Every, lots of hands went up. Everyone younger than me uses Yelp. That's coming for private schools. Greatschools.org, private school review. And greatschools.org just got a, a big in, millions of dollars from the Walton Foundation to beef up their website. That's going to be the future of how people choose schools, crowdsourcing. And I'll turn it over to Jim. And, oh, and our report is available at edchoice.org slash more than scores, if you're interested. So just to briefly recap, and then I'll briefly come to a close. Uh, according to the survey resort, Results, Gold Scholarship parents are seeking a more disciplined, safe, and orderly school, peer, and classroom environment, a better education where their child receives personalized attention, religious or character education, they want their children prepared for success in college, and they do not emphasize student results on standardized tests. So to what extent do K-12 through education policymakers at the state, local, and national levels understand and respect the reasons why voucher and scholarship parents are choosing to send their children to private schools. So parent reason number one, parents want a safe, disciplined, and orderly school, peer, and classroom environment. But there's a contradiction very current in the news. 
concerned about the disproportionately higher number of minority students that are being disciplined, on January 8th of this year, the U.S. Education and Justice Departments issued joint guidance to K-12 schools nationwide on the need to avoid disciplinary policies that discriminate on the basis of race or ethnicity. So now if a local school district refrains from disciplining unruly students because their lawyers advise them the Justice Department is going to take a close look at their outcomes, then the learning of many well-behaved African-American or Latino kids will be negatively impacted. Parent reason number two. Parents want religious or character education for their children. Uh, by reason of an introduction to a former Atlanta school teacher many years ago, I secured a copy of what, an original copy of what was called the a resource guide to moral and spiritual values that was uh, designed to be taught in the Atlanta public school system in 1966. And uh, they were wrestling with, after some of the Supreme Court decisions about church and state issues, how can they still teach these values in Atlanta public schools? And in the foreword, to quote John Martin, the most important educational task facing the public schools today is to teach those moral and spiritual values that underlie the principles upon which our country was formed. Yet there's a contradiction Effective in 1997, Georgia law mandates that public schools teach a comprehensive character education program, which local schools were to have implemented beginning in 2000-2001. By the end of the decade, few local school districts were complying with the mandate. Parent reason number three, parents want their children prepared for success in college, but there's a contradiction. Is, is, it's, uh, career uh, training is important. Uh, however, the Georgia Department of Education's Career Development Initiative promotes tools, knowledge, and resources for systematic, developmental, and comprehensive career planning for all students in grades K through 12. And this uh, quote from David Turner, uh, the director of Georgia Career Technical and Agricultural Education, a newsletter in the fall of 2013 reads, quote, I hope you are working with your school counselors to ensure that your system is focusing on career awareness in elementary schools, career exploration in middle schools, and career development in the high schools. Parent reason number four, parents are relatively unconcerned about student standardized test scores. The contradiction is that the Common Core state standards and student data collection have become uh, adopted by, I think it's about 45 states now, uh, and uh, some reformers actually want to impose the Common Core standards on private schools that accept scholarship or voucher students, which means they will have to align their curriculum to those standards, which means testing students on that curriculum, which means teaching to standardize tests, just like the public schools the families are trying to escape. So we're at a crossroads in Georgia and nationally, I believe, between an educational opportunity system, I'm sorry, educational opportunity society versus an educational operating system. And just briefly, what will that entail? In the educational opportunity society, you provide choices to concerned parents who conscientiously commit to a school community that will enable their children to become competent and creative adults with character. In an educational operating system, you coerce parents into a common core framework designed to centralize, calibrate, and control education to facilitate careers, conformity, commerce, and comparison. And with that, uh, Kelly, we'll take any questions you have or questions that the audience has.